Okay, so let's get started here. Let me tell you a little bit about who we treat here at Evolve Treatment Centers. We treat adolescents age 12 to 17 years old, struggling with mental health issues. They may come in previously diagnosed, or we may be able to work on some working diagnoses and assessments here um, and possible rule outs. Um, some of the behaviors that we do treat quite often, anxiety, depression, suicidality, you know, which is a, a big one that we're discussing today, self-harm behaviors, um, mild psychosis, borderline personality disorder, um, which is a, a big one that we see across all programs, especially here at the Van Alden location. We treat substance abuse and behavioral disorders. So even if a client doesn't meet criteria for a specific disorder, just any type of emotion dysregulation disorder they may have is something that we can work with here. So the different programs that we have um, are, are assisted by admissions matching you up with the appropriate level of care for your team. And so we do have three levels of care that we um, have spanning across our programs. Um, the highest level of care would be residential. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, then a step down from this would be partial hospitalization or PHP. And that's something that we may step our clients from RTC down to as they leave Evolve, whether it's through our own Evolve PHP or a provider back home near them. Um, after PHP is our intensive outpatient. Um, and so that may be the appropriate level of care to step down. And sometimes we do have them go through all three, RTC to PHP to IOP. That gives them kind of a stepping stone and a stepping block to transition back into just weekly outpatient therapy. So that's a little bit about the Evolve programs that we have here. And for anyone that would be unsure about what level is appropriate for their, their team, you know, our admissions can help uh, kind of assess that out. So in discussing the topic that we have ready for today, um, the Evolve residential model helps um, greatly with helping suicidal behaviors and self-harm behaviors, which is gonna be our talking point today. So in our residential model, we do have 24 hour support and supervision. We have overnight wake staff and our residential counselors that work eight hour shifts throughout the day and are with clients at all times. Um, our length of stay is roughly about 30 to 60 days, which we start to assess and figure out um, week to week with, with the needs of the client. We do only have six clients per home in the residential model. Um, we are able to treat uh, co-ed, so all genders, we're LGBT um, affirming and, and support to. Um, with only having six clients in the home, each therapist has three clients each on their caseload, which may seem small, but they, they do give a lot of care and a lot of support um, to those three clients each that they have, because we do offer individual therapy that is three times weekly. We also have family therapy twice weekly, which usually will consist of a parent phone call between just the parents and therapist or caregivers, um, and then a family session, including the client. As needed, family therapy can be bumped up to twice weekly um, as the family therapy and the family unit and system is such a big part of treatment. We do have psychiatric consultation weekly. Our clients do meet with um, Dr. Vallis weekly here at the Van Alden location and with our other um, psychiatrists if they're at different locations. We have group therapy and psychoeducation type groups all throughout the week, even, um, even some on the weekends. We do offer DBT therapy four times weekly, which provides a lot of education and, and lessons on the DBT skills. We have school two hours daily um, and can offer one-to-one -one patient monitoring if needed. Clients do come in. Um, on standard admission protocol of one-to-one -one for 24 hours where the staff is within an arm's length of them to provide that extra support as needed. And we do have on-site nursing at least eight hours of the day and on-call as needed. So the therapeutic approaches that we take here at Evolve um, consist of, but are not limited to the following that we have here, dialectical behavior therapy being a big one, uh, CBT, 
solution focus, behavior activation, um, with with getting clients kind of active and, and motivated to keep positive emotions going. Um, we have the family therapy, motivational interviewing, which can be really helpful in psychiatry. Um, we have seeking safety and relapse prevention type groups and therapeutic approaches that are really helpful and beneficial to the clients here. Okay. So speaking more about dialectical behavior therapy at Evolve, we do have DBT informed programs and then our comprehensive DBT program. And I'll tell you a little bit about the difference between the two. So a DBT informed program is offered at all of our locations and all levels of care. And so that's used in conjunction with the other evidence-based treatment modalities such as CBT and the like that I mentioned earlier. Um, the comprehensive DBT program is the one that we have here at Evolve Tarzana in Van Alden, or Tarzana, Van Alden in Tarzana. And so that's the, the house that I currently belong to and I'm the clinical program director at. This is a fully adherent comprehensive DBT program. And what this entails is that the um, individual therapy sessions are set up to be uh, a DBT format and agenda with diary cards. We have on-site skills coaching. Um, completed by the residential counselors um, in the moment as needed. Um, staff are available 24 7 for that, even overnight. Um, they receive the skills training throughout the week. And our team is a part of a DBT consultation team where we are a support to each other as working professionals in working with these high risk cases. Okay. Thank you, and let's get started. Again, I am Rebecca DeLeon, the Clinical Program Director here at Evolve Van Alden, and we're gonna be discussing reducing stigma around suicide and self-harm. So what is self-harm? Let's talk about this. So according to NAMI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness, self-harm or self-injury or non-suicidal self-injury as it is termed sometimes means hurting yourself on purpose one common method is cutting with sharp objects but anytime someone deliberately hurts themselves is classified as self-harm some people feel an impulse to cause burns pull out hair or pick out wounds to prevent healing extreme injuries can result in broken bones. And this is something that we do see here within our treatment centers and, and residential, and just having the supportive environment here to have these discussions also helps to reduce the, the stigma of calling it out by name and addressing it here directly. So we're gonna get into what types of self-harm there are that a, a team that you know or teams out there may be involved in. So types of self-harm that are more commonly seen are cutting, and this can be with razors. It can be razors that they find from box cutters, uh, razors uh, used for shaving, or even just typical everyday items that you wouldn't think one would use, anything that can cause you know, cutting of the skin. Some clients uh, may use behaviors, and it's either uh, overtly biting the outside of their body or maybe biting on the inside of their mouth or cheeks to, to feel some kind of you know, self-harm sensation. Um, as stated before, burning can also be a common practice for self-harm. Um, punching, whether it's inflicted bodily injury to self or to walls or other objects around, punching can be a form of self-harm banging body parts on hard surfaces. So purposely trying to, to harm oneself by running into things or, or banging body parts and even hair pulling. So as mild as that one may be at times. So these are some different types of self-harm but not limited to the ones that, that we have seen and can treat here. And calling them out by name and discussing them kind of helps just put it out there that this is something that is treatable. So why do teens self-harm? So we know that self-harm acts as a maladaptive coping skill for these teens. And it's something that they can do to calm themselves. It, it can give them a feeling of release. So um, it's a way for them to get out the emotional pain that they're feeling inside. So also the physical pain of self-harming can match the emotional pain that they're feeling on the inside. And to some, it almost proves to themselves how much emotional pain they are in by showing it on the outside or proving it to themselves. 
Um, it can also be used as retaliation toward self. It's I don't deserve to get better. I'm the one that's caused these problems or growing up or are deserving of this or situations that they have found them in, themselves in or things that they have done to kind of make life uneasy for family members or those around them. They can use it as a retaliation towards self and almost feel that they're deserving of it. So lots of different ways that teens self-harm. Uh, for some of them, it's the only way they know how to kind of ground themselves. So it can be more of an unhealthy way to get the body to kind of self-regulate. For some teens, this is just the quick, easy way or the only way they ever really knew how. Um, some other actual reasons why teens may self-harm could be that they are trying to fit in or copy what other, what other people are doing uh, around them. So we have a couple more here on this next slide. So again, talking about a way to feel something, a lot of them can feel numb and empty inside. Uh, a lot of the teens that come in with BPD or BPD traits um, or major depressive disorders feel that emptiness and feel that numbness and want to find some way to feel something. Um, and, and pain is usually a way to get that across. At times, it can also communicate the severity of their emotions. They want the outside to match the inside also for others to see. So this is something that they may do very um, overtly and want others to pay attention to or notice. So we also can see it as a way to seek validation from others. If I do this, maybe people will really understand the pain I'm in and start showing a little bit more attention or take me seriously, or maybe um, friends and people will come to caretake and see if I'm okay. So there's lots of different reasons why teens self-harm and in the hierarchy that we take with DBT, we do try to address prompting events for self-harm and, and help the teen understand why they're engaging in this and um, help them find other more healthy DBT skills to utilize instead. So what would be then some of the warning signs? How would you know that maybe a teen or a loved one that you know or someone around you um, might be engaging in this behavior? So there might be an increased or a sudden onset of, of drug or alcohol use. Maybe they're using that as a way to, to numb pain and um, emotional pain and then using self-harm as a way to feel again and kind of get stuck in this, this vicious cycle. Um, other warning signs, mood swings. So when we see teens coming in with BPD or major depressive disorder, we know that their mood can shift rapidly. They can um, you know, be feeling kind of jovial and, and lighthearted and then kind of swing over to feeling more depressed and irritable. We know that teens that come in um, with major depressive disorder, it's not just a, a deep sadness for them. This can also show up as irritability. Um, increasing low self-esteem if they feel um, that they don't have people to connect with or they're, they're not kind of worth much. It, it could be like, you know, what do I even matter anyway? And they start to engage in some self-harm. They may start to pull away from friends and family, especially those that they maybe had a close tight-knit group with and, and even started pulling away from them. Um, wearing long sleeves or clothing in hot weather. So this would be something that we would find kind of peculiar or want to check in a little bit more about. And it, if this is something that you've seen kind of happening with a team that you know, this would be a, a helpful kind of warning site to kind of check in and say, you know, I've noticed that you're wearing kind of a long sleeve shirt in this hot weather. Is there something that you're trying to cover up or hide? And, and maybe even straight out ask them, you know, are you engaging in self-harm and trying to cover it up if you know that they've been struggling? They might start to journal suicide notes um, or write stories and fantasies about how they may want to hurt themselves or how they may want to enact um, in suicidal behavior. 
in, they, they may try to play it off that it's, it's just a story or it's just a way of expressing my emotions, but this could be a warning sign that there is more there that needs to be looked into. Um, their their school worker grades could suffer. Um, this is another issue that can come up. It's, it's really hard to stay, to stay focused on school when you have these types of behaviors going on. If you're thinking about self-harm, if you're thinking about suicide, if you feel like that's the only way out for you. And then for suicide, possibly giving away possessions or personal items, knowing that they may not be around anymore. Um, talking that they have no goals or things worth living for, because it doesn't matter. I won't, I won't live that long anyway. Um, so that can be warning signs of increased self-harm or the beginnings of suicide communication or thoughts of suicide. So what are some increased risk factors that might put a teen kind of on the path toward these behaviors? So societal disapproval is a big one. If teens are feeling that they're not supported in their beliefs, uh, whether it be religious, cultural, um, identity beliefs, um, what they're into and interested in, how they believe, um, when, there's, when there's no kind of support group or, or niche from them, that can be an increased risk factor to kind of turn physical pain inward for themselves. Um, of course, increased risk factors of bullying, you know, feeling that even going to school is not a safe place um, and, and feeling like they don't have uh, people to connect with or talk with at school can increase this. An increased risk factor for looking to act on suicide is if they easily have access to lethal means, if they know that there's a weapon in the house, if they know that they could easily go and get one, if they know people that have guns or weapons on them, it can make it easier for them to, to seek that out and utilize that. Um, lack of resources in their community. If they don't know that there's support out there and people that they can talk to about these feelings, then that's something that's gonna put them at increased risk of trying to find their own means of handling the pain that they're in. Maybe there is a loss of a relationship or abuse uh, in a relationship. And so they, those with BPD, will intensely idealize people in their lives and, and choose to grow close to them even when it's not a healthy relationship. So if there's a loss or there's abuse in that relationship and they're still idealizing that relationship, that can be devastating when it's you know, become, become non-existent anymore. We know that if they already have a diagnosed mental illness and they know that they have these struggles and, and they may start to feel like they're different, um, that can increase their risk to engage in self-harm or find ways to um, increase their suicide communication. And if they've had a previous suicide attempt, it can put them higher risk to trying again. So what do suicidal thoughts or suicidal communication look like? So there might be somebody that journals or talks about it or has engaged in some methods of self-harm. When it gets to a point where they're starting to gather items to an act attempt, they're saying something. They're, they're demonstrating that they're taking this kind of up to the next level um, to actually maybe follow through with something um, in an impulsive kind of moment or decision. So if they're looking to get a gun, they may be figuring out ways to, to tie a noose and use a noose in their room or, or in a place out in the community that they think would, um, would help them enact you know, this type of behavior. Um, we see teens that come in and um, end up sharing with families that they have sharks in their room and they find different ways and different uses to engage in self-harm or I need to hold on to this just in case I can't take it anymore. Um, I have cheeking or hoarding meds here. Now, if a client is um, self-administering medication, they wouldn't have to kind of cheek it. They would just be, you know, kind of stating that they're using it when in reality, they might be saving it up. Um, if, if they're at home and their meds are being given to them, it would be important to ensure that they're actually swallowing it. That's, um, a big piece of how we assist teens here in treatment to ensure that they're getting the medication that's prescribed to them and that they need and that they're not able to hold on to it is that we, we 
you know, kind of do a mouth check and, and swish around the mouth to ensure that they can't cheek or hoard those meds to, to save up to do something dangerous with. Um, another piece of suicidal communication could be engaging in more dangerous activities. They may not care if they're in a friend's car and they're going speeding or they themselves are old enough to drive and speeding, um, maybe hanging around train tracks or um, walking along bridges or unsafe roads. So they may engage in these activities that um, would be considered dangerous and that um, the typical person wouldn't want to do, but for them, it's, it doesn't matter anyway. So we start to see that kind of amp up. Um, they may also kind of hang around kind of older influences or, or people around them that they know are more likely to engage in these unhealthy behaviors. And so they might start hanging around people more so that are not a good influence on them. Suicidal thoughts and communication, I think I previously stated, can start as increased self-harm. And then when they start to kind of feel numb to this, it's not giving the same effects that it used to, um, they, they can amp it up to something that's, that's more lethal. So when we see an increase in self-harm, we want to kind of intervene to ensure that we can help them before it gets to a point where something is done impulsively. And then again, pulling away from friends or family. I think that makes it easier to kind of cut emotional connection. If I started to pull away now, then maybe they won't miss me as much when I'm gone. It won't hurt as much. So, and these are, these are tough things to have to talk about and have to think about. And this is why we're talking about it today, that this needs to be important conversation. So here's why teens won't speak up. And, and that's what we're discussing today is there is this stigma that those with mental health issues or engaging in these behaviors, uh, there's something wrong with them and they're different. You know, the teens don't want to be the one with the mental problems. You know, my siblings or my brothers or my friends don't deal with this. Why do I have to be the one that has the mental problem? Why do I have to be the one that has to go see the school counselor? Why do I have to be the one that goes to therapy after school? You know, they, they don't want to be classified as different. I don't think any teen really does in this regard. Um, if someone knew that they were seeking support or seeing the school counselor, uh, would that foster more bullying? Because then people would start to kind of find out and know that there's something going on with them. And so that's something that we see uh, coming in here is that there's a, a large history of bullying for uh, the clients that we treat. They might start to think, how will this impact my future? For those of them that start to think that they could have a future, it could be, well, I don't want to say anything because I can get through it on my own. I don't want anyone to know and have this be an issue later. For those that are at a place where they're thinking about a future, they're thinking about, I do still have some things worth living for, some things I would like to do. It's what would go into my medical record? What would people be able to know about me? And there's concern there about how it would impact the future. Would this impact me getting a job or going to college? Um, and then oftentimes teens don't wanna worry friends or families. They think that they can deal with it on their own. I'm struggling, but if I just engage in my self-harm, it helps keep me grounded. I'm okay. I don't have to you know, burden anybody else. Um, the problem with that is that we know that self-harm is not a sustainable, healthy coping skill, and it leads to greater um, concern or, or higher levels of suicidal communication. So this is why teens won't speak up. They don't want to be the one perceived as different. They don't want to be the one to be the burden. And, and so if, if we start talking about mental health and how it can be supported in ways that are just normalized, this is something that they would just see as, I might need a math tutor. I need some extra support in getting my homework or things done. So the importance in reducing the stigma is why we are here today, is that we as mental health care providers and parents and caregivers and teachers need to be the ones to start these conversations and have these conversations as if they were everyday practice and, and a part of just kind of growing up of, you know, when you feel sad, when you feel down, what are ways that you cope with it? Do you feel like you're more sad than other people around you? Do you feel kind of that you're, you struggle with your mood more often? Start a conversation so that we can see these warning signs and see these risk factors earlier on than, than we have before. Don't be afraid to call it out. Here at um, 
Evolve, especially here at Evolve Van Alden with our comprehensive DBT, we call it by its name. Clients are oriented that when they come in, they're doing DBT therapy. And we have a stage of, of um, treatment that we do, and we have a hierarchy of needs. And the first hierarchy that we address before we can move on to other things are life-threatening behaviors. And that would be suicide, um, intense and heavy drug and alcohol use, um, and self-harm. And a teen can't start talking about a bunch of other things that they may want to start talking about if these behaviors are still on the table. So we call it out, we share what it is. And here, when they are on the floor with their peers, they refer to it as target behaviors. We don't kind of throw the language out um, so much in the, in the milieu. So as not to kind of trigger different clients, we know that they're at different stages of their treatment when they're all here together. In sessions, it is, it is called out. And in their diary card groups, it's what was your intensity of thought or an urge to engage in self-harm the day before? What was your, your urge or intensity of thought for increased suicide? And so we do call it by name and it, it doesn't have to be something that we tiptoe around. So we need to uh, take a loved one to the ER if there's concern. We do get cases that come in where they have not attempted or engaged in any kind of suicidal behavior or act, but the families or the team themselves didn't feel like they could be safe at home. And so they were taken to an ER to be evaluated and then um, possibly sent here um, for the residential support. So there, there's nothing wrong with a, a teen or a family feeling like, I don't know if I have the tools to support them in this home. I need to see if there is uh, more help out there for them. And assisting them in talking with a professional and, and helping the conversation along that there are these evidence-based practices out there, specifically DBT, that was designed to help treat suicide, um, communication, behavior, attempts, and self-harm. So uh, DBT also works with increasing willingness. Willingness over willfulness is, is a huge piece here. Um, of distress tolerance and how a lot of our clients start out here in treatment. They have to be willing to have these conversations and to work on these target behaviors. So it's really important for us to, to increase conversation and take that stigma away by acting like it, it's, it can't happen to someone that we know and care about. So then you might be thinking, how can I help? What, what do I do? What do I say? And first and foremost, it can just be to listen. If a teen is coming to you, sharing that they're having some of these struggles, sharing that they're in emotional pain, sharing that they feel different, or even getting to the point of sharing that they are engaging in um, self-harm behaviors, it's to listen and, and you can ask them. So when you feel this down, what do you do? Do you use drugs? Do you, do you hurt yourself? What is it that you've done? Um, and I think the, the most important thing is to listen. And if they're willing to answer questions and open up, great. If, if all you can do is listen and be there for them and assist them in talking to a, a professional, that's great too. So, cause you don't have to do it alone. No one does. When we listen, another important thing we can do is to validate the team. If they come and share, I'm, I've been drinking a lot, I'm self-harming, we're gonna kind of feel like, oh goodness, why are you engaging in these behaviors? What the team's gonna need to hear from us is the understanding of the emotional piece, which we'll talk about in the next slide. And then of course, seek out professional help. So if they're coming to you as a caregiver, a teacher, um, a friend, or if they're coming to you as a, uh, outpatient professional and you feel that they need a higher level of care to recommend, you know, higher level of care or going to a hospital is needed. So how to validate and what to say. Validation is a huge piece in DBT um, and validation does not mean that we have to agree. So it's, you know, it's not, well, I'm not going to validate this behavior. I'm not okay with this or this is not okay. It's really more so understanding the emotion behind the, the behavior or the emotional pain behind what behavior you're, you're seeing enacted. Um, so what's happening that's lending itself toward self-harm and suicidal communication. And you can talk about self-harm and suicide using the words and language, as I've been saying throughout, don't be afraid to call it out and name it. And that helps reduce that stigma that we're saying, are you self-harming? Are you thinking about methods for suicide? Is that something that you think about? How can I support you? 
um, there's this, there's this myth that if I bring it up, will that cause them to then want to enact on it? Will that put the idea in their head? This is untrue to where if we bring this up and ask a teen, are you thinking of suicide? Are you wishing that you were no longer here? It doesn't give them the idea. In fact, in a lot of ways, it helps validate their pain and their struggle that somebody's starting to see them. Somebody may be starting to pick up and understand that there is a struggle there. So validation is a huge piece of DBT and, and you know, a, a skill and a tactic that we use here often. This is a big piece in family uh, session and family therapy is that um, parents have struggled with their teen. You know, the, the, the teens aren't always innocent coming here. They, they are engaging in behaviors at home that make it upsetting and difficult for the whole family. And we really do teach caregivers and families how to validate the emotion that their teen or child may be experiencing without saying that you're okay with the behaviors that they've been engaging in or, or doing. So it, it could be, it seems like you're in a lot of pain to be going on social media saying the things that you're saying or, or going out past curfew doing these things. Sounds like you're really struggling. That's a, a great way to validate without actually kind of acknowledging that it's okay that you're going out and staying out late because you're hurting. It's, it's really just taking that emotional piece without agreeing or saying that you're okay with the behaviors that they're choosing to use or do. So how do we treat self-harm and suicide communication here at Evolve? When we have teens that come in, um, especially here at Van Alden, we know that they're coming from uh, most likely a hospital or needing to step up to a higher level of care. We're used to dealing with teens that have had suicide attempts. So that's why we use the comprehensive DBT treatment approach because it's clinically and evidence-based proven to help reduce these behaviors. Um, they are given a daily diary card. They fill it out every morning to report on the day before, and it tracks their intensity of thought for suicide or self-harm. They may also reference it as an urge, but it's more so how much am I thinking about it up here? Um, an urge can also be more of like a visceral reaction to act, but we also want to know how often and how much are they thinking about it? This is something that's tracked daily on their diary card as well as a brief in-session diary card every time that they have a session with their therapist. So we're able to kind of keep track and see the ebbs and the flows of the intensity of wanting to engage in self-harm or find methods and ways to act on suicide. We offer the 24 seven skills coaching. So when DBT was created outpatient, they would be calling their therapist after hours um, in this commitment to ask for help and support in using a helpful skill and effective skill rather than engaging in their self-harm or wanting to act on suicide. Luckily for us, we have um, the ability to have the 24 seven monitoring here um, in residential. Um, but for those teens that are in outpatient um, PHP or IOP doing DBT therapy um, or doing it with Evolve, um, they would have that available to them as well. Here it's done by our counselors because they're the ones that are immediately um, on the floor with the teens at all times. We also utilize behavior chain analysis. So when our teens come in here, um, the therapist is going to, um, as immediately as possible, start to investigate, as you will, what led to the latest suicide attempt through a behavior chain um, without events that happen, um, actions that are taken, behaviors that, that are acted on, uh, thoughts that are had, uh, cognitions, um, emotions that are felt kind of line by line by line leading up to how did this event happen. From vulnerability factors, here's what I've been dealing with in my life, to here's what the prompting event was that kind of led me on this track to go into my room and self-harm or to go in and, and take all the pills to overdose in a suicide attempt. So we do conduct these behavior chains with them constantly um, along with a solution analysis. If they're sharing about how things got to this behavior, we also then want them to know that there is a solution to this. If you were ever in a situation like this again, here are all these skills that we can fit in along the way that you're now learning that will help you better communicate your needs versus act on this ineffective um, behavior. 
we have the 24 hour rule. This works really well for our outpatient therapist. The way that we can use it here in residential is that if a team is not willing to speak up or not ask for skills coaching and find some way to engage in self-harm, and it could be as simple as like scratching with their nails or, or using their pencil or finding something, if they do engage in self-harm, um, the therapist can choose to not see them for 24 hours. If they have a session set up that's already on the books and ready to go, that can be had as usual. Um, otherwise, the, the therapist will refuse to see them hours um, as a way to kind of, you've already solved your problem. You don't need to meet with me because you chose to do this instead. The reason that this works is because we know with our um, clients with severe emotion dysregulation or the ones that have the BPD diagnosis, they really crave that one-on-one -on -one time. They they tend to enjoy their therapy sessions once they, once they start to connect with their therapist. And so they'll find this 24-hour rule aversive and want to find any means possible to still be able to connect and have those sessions. Um, so we're constantly assessing risk. If we know that teens have a, a, a self-harm history and suicide communication or attempts, um, we're constantly assessing. They come in, um, get in the full-scale Columbia assessment and self-harm assessment. We'll reevaluate after 24 hours and then as needed when new information is brought up or discussed by the team for us to reevaluate their, their safety. And we have ways for increasing methods of safety. If a teen, um, no matter what level is on, is needing more support, we can put them back on a one-to-one -one, um, support where the, where the staff is nearby and with them at all times for the teen to feel like they're just immediately right there for me to reach out as needed. Oh, I think I went too far. Oh, we're good. Nope, went too far. <laughs> okay. So as I talked about, we have the 24 hour support and supervision here in residential. Clients must be in line of sight, in line of hearing. We wanna know if teens are talking about self-harm or suicide. We don't want this being discussed in the know you, or we want them to know that we're gonna be listening in as a way to provide oversight, but as a way of showing them that we're here to support them. That if they have these feelings or these thoughts at any point in time, they can come and share it. So, um, Staff definitely holds clients accountable to their treatment goals and behaviors and helps facilitate interventions on the floor. So because we know they're coming in um, with, with a lot of self-harm and suicide behaviors, we're calling out and reducing the stigma here by, we know you have these behaviors. We're gonna help you talk about it, engage in new and effective ways of dealing with it and go home with new coping skills to continue your outpatient therapy and support and utilize your family to, to assist you um, as well. We're calling it out, we're putting names to it. We're talking about what needs to be talked about to send them home with a, a much greater toolkit. Okay. So this is 24 hour support. All of our sharps are locked up here. Um, even so far as our pencils, when uh, when the teens need to use pens or pencils for treatment assignments, it's it's locked up at all times. The counselors take it out and will hand each one out to them with their name on it. Everything's accounted for. Sharps counts are done at the end of every single shift that we have to ensure that everything is accounted for. Um, medication is double locked and all cabinets, bathrooms, offices, bedrooms, everything is locked when not in use to just to kind of minimize any kind of risk there. Okay. So that is a brief overview about suicide communication and self-harm and, and attempting to reduce the stigma by talking about it and showing the different ways and treatment methods that are helpful in in getting teams the support that they need. So I really appreciate everyone that was able to make it here today. And I hope that this was helpful in just understanding that it's okay to have these conversations as difficult as they may seem, um, as long as we take the, the, the idea of validation and support to get the team the help that they need, it's okay to have these conversations and start the dialogue. Um, 
So I thank you for being here today for that. Here are some resources for, for teens and for families. These are some, some kind of basic general resources. And then if you want ones more geared towards self-harm, suicide, um, and DBT, you could even reach out to our admissions team, uh, team for an assessment for someone you know or how to get more resources for your area. And so I wanna thank you all so much for joining me here today. Um, join us again for our next community workshop next month on July 28th. Uh, the topic for next month is understanding normal versus abnormal teen behavior. And you can register now on our website. And thanks again for being here with us. Thanks, everyone.